other communities who may be here today. I would also like to note that this week is NADOC week, and the theme for this is Voice Treaty Truth. Let's work together for a shared future. And on seeing our first session today, you'll see some really good solid examples of disability advocates working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in practical ways. I would like to welcome those of you who have joined us online. Just remember to check on the bottom of the screen, you will see a phone number where you can text in your questions and participate today. A few little housekeeping things to sort. The toilets are outside the glass doors and to a sharp right. Lunch will be at 12 to 1 o'clock and afternoon tea at 2 to 2.30. And if you have a question throughout today, please raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone. Yeah. So our first session today is disability advocates working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And these two really special people from Grampian Disability Advocacy and Rights Information Advocacy Centre have both had projects to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and work out how to best support people with disabilities in those communities, funded by the Disability Advocacy Innovation Fund. And we would hear today about how their projects have gone and I'm sure you're all as excited as I am to learn what they've found. So welcome to Lance Houston and Deb Burden. Uh, thanks, Melissa and Daru, for inviting Grampians Advocacy to be part of today's presentations. And hello, everyone. It's great to be with you, especially during NADOC Week, talking about this topic. Grampians Disability Advocacy acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. We particularly pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land we are meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to Aboriginal elders of any other communities who may be here with us. So I'm here to talk about the Wimmera Indigenous Advocacy Project. And this has been funded by the Victorian Government Disability Advocacy Innovation Fund over the past two years, so from 2017 till now. But I'd like to start with a little bit of background about the Wimmera. The Wimmera region covers 42,000 square kilometres in the west of Victoria and has a population of about 55,000. It boasts the Little Desert, the Mallee Fowl, searing hot days, frosty winter mornings, breathtaking sunsets, the Silo Art Trail, and a range of diverse communities. Major cities and towns are Horsham, Warwick Nabeel, and Nil. And some of you may have visited some of those places. Uh, the only really practical way to get to the Wimmera is by car, especially if you have a disability. V-Line is the public transport provider and provides a combination of train and coach with timetables subject to change at a moment's notice. And anyone here from a rural area will know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe even Melbourne people too at the moment. So. By car from Melbourne, it's an hour and a half to Ballarat, then an hour on top of that to Ararat, then an hour and a quarter on top of that to Horsham, then another hour to Nil, if you are going that far. And from Nil, it's only another hour to South Australia. So you're looking at a five, four to five hour road trip one way. We're talking a truly rural, remote region. I'm telling you this by way of explaining why we are a small contingent today. It wasn't possible for staff of the Gulam Gulam Co-op 
or the elders group to attend in person. But we do have a video to show you a little later on featuring Auntie Elva Taylor. Meantime, due to the circumstances, the community has said that it's okay for me to speak on their behalf about our project. So just to introduce those from GDA who are able to be here. So Fiona Tipping is our Indigenous Advocate for Ballarat. Fiona is a proud Palawa woman who is a member of the Ballarat and District Aboriginal Co-op and has been providing advocacy at the co-op for eight years. This has been done without any specific funding for this work. It's come out of our recurrent funds. Likewise, our Wimmera advocate, Trudy Joyce, who unfortunately can't be here today, has worked with Gulam Gulam Co-op for five years prior to the grant funding. Kim Weesey, is a proud Gunjamara woman from the southwest region of Victoria and our Indigenous advocate for the Wimmera. She has joined our Horsham advocate Trudy Joyce in working with the Elders Group and the Family Services team at Goolam Goolam Aboriginal Co-op in Horsham. The Wimmera project funding has allowed GDA to concentrate its efforts on forging a strong relationship with the Co-op and to employ an Aboriginal person as an advocate. So today, after all that, GDA and REAC, and Lance is here from REAC, have been invited to talk about how we have utilised the Disability Advocacy Innovation Grant to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with a disability in our respective regions. We've been asked to detail the outcomes and learnings of our work over the past two years. To do this from GDA's perspective, I have to take you back just a little bit in time. I want to give you a bit of the background to GDA's Indigenous program because the Indigenous, the, uh, sorry, the Innovation Grant and the work associated with it does not exist in a vacuum. In fact, it would have been difficult to achieve anything if it did. GDA has been working on improving its engagement with Indigenous communities in our region since 2008. In some ways, the innovation funding was the culmination of a long-term effort to improve our relationships with community. We knew there was an unmet need. So we accessed additional funding to employ a project worker and we set about building relationships. In 2010, we contracted researcher Joanne Ritchie to produce a groundbreaking report titled Indigenous People with a Disability, Population Distribution and Service Use in the Grampians Region. This is the first time anyone had brought together the data about the Grampians. This helped us to further understand the task we were undertaking for instance, we learnt that there is no word for ab in Aboriginal language for disability. Another thing the research revealed was that the rate of disability among Indigenous people in the Grampians was about 50% as compared with 20% in the general population. This point was also made by Scott Avery in his presentation, Culture is Inclusion, at Daru in February. So about eight years ago, our advocate Fiona started attending the Ballarat Co-op one day a week. She didn't see the need for an office or a meeting room. Fiona's advocacy began at the tea room table on the busiest day of the week and has continued in this way ever since. Other organisations are now adopting this method as the ideal way to build trust and form relationships. We are grateful to BADAC CEO Karen Heap and the members and the staff who have welcomed GDA into community. This was aided in no small part by the fact that Fiona has been formally recognised as one of the Ballarat mob. So that's the backgrounding done and now it brings me to the point of talking about the Innovation Fund 
and engagement with community in the Wimmera. Once again, it's important to note that our work with Goolam Goolam Co-op in Horsham did not begin with the Innovation Grant. GDA's Horsham advocate Trudy Joyce has been establishing connections with community for many years before the grant became available. The great advantage of the Innovation Grant was the significantly increased resources that allowed us to focus on consolidating and formalising our relationship with Goolam Goolam, as well as employing an Indigenous person as an advocate. Many people in this room have already been working with Indigenous communities without specific funding in the same way we did. So I apologise in advance for speaking about lessons you've probably already learnt. We are by no means experts on this topic. There's lots of ways of getting to the same result and hopefully we'll hear about some of those later. We're just happy to share our experiences as invited. So for those yet to embark on the joint journey of forming relationships with community, there are a number of key points to keep in mind that we've discovered through our work. While at the same time acknowledging that each community is different and it's not a case of one size fits all. We have noticed enormous differences between the two co-ops where we work, which are at different ends of our region. Yet there are also many commonalities. So here we go in no particular order. Firstly, the co-op is the central hub. It's the place where all services come from. It's a trusted space and a safe meeting place. So it's important to take the time to set up the mechanics of your relationship. A memorandum of understanding, introductions to key people, elders, the CEO, board members and staff. It's important to have everyone's support right from the start. Tell people how your organisation can value add to the amazing work that's already being done at the co-op in really difficult circumstances. Initially, we talked about GDA's knowledge of the NDIS as a way of demonstrating a particular area where we can help, but there are others. Consult with co-op members about what advocacy should look like in their domain. Also, it's important to gain an understanding of the history of dispossession and oppression experienced by Indigenous people since white colonisation. Ask people about the history of the co-op you'll be working in and with. Learn about the stolen generations. If you don't, you may find it hard to relate to the hurt in the hearts of so many and the deep distrust of government departments and authoritarian institutions. Most importantly, visit the First People's Disability Network website and read Scott Avery's book, Culture is Inclusion, to gain an understanding of the complexities of transgenerational trauma and its effect on community. Also, it's impossible to overestimate the importance of listening. Elders have explained to us that people are shy and often don't speak their minds for a variety of reasons. So be prepared to sit down for a while, listen, yarn, talk about whatever people want to talk about. It helps to engage in an activity while talking. Try and explain things simply and avoid jargon. Dedicate the time to building trust and the respectful relationships will surely follow. Be authentic. Admit the things you don't know. Respectfully ask people about their experiences, the things that are barriers for them. Don't assume you know what it's like to be an Indigenous person if you aren't one. And don't be afraid of making mistakes or saying the wrong thing. Indigenous staff at Goolam Goolam have taught us of the importance of being visible at the co-op, just being around and making an effort to connect 
if you don't already have connections with community. Go to NAIDOC week and local celebrations. At Goolam Goolam, our advocates visit with the elders group one day a week. They share lunch, do art or craft, or just talk. It's in this context that issues that require advocacy are raised. In short, you just have to be there. Relax, spend the time, because tokenistic efforts are easily spotted. Another thing is to acknowledge that Indigenous people have many complex issues that affect their lives. Family, health, disability, financial, legal, education, employment, and there are many, many more. Again, consult Scott Avery's book for information about intersectionality. Many calls for help are crisis-driven and concern basic human rights like the right to housing and the right to family connection. This is where it's essential to work in conjunction with the co-op so that the whole support team is working in the same direction. There's always a lot going on. Don't be surprised or offended if your advocacy program is not always front of mind for people in distress. Just keep trying to engage and be there when people are ready. A lack of contact for a while does not mean you are not needed. As a result, it's often necessary to keep a case open longer than you normally would as people engage as they are able to. So after that rather long-winded speech, I'll just sum up to say it's important to be prepared to do things differently in our experience. Be led by community, be open to change, be flexible, be real. Just a final comment on funding. This Office for Disability here. <laughs> um, the resources made available through the Innovation Fund have been invaluable in establishing a sustainable relationship with Goolam Goolam. We have been able to employ an Indigenous person as an advocate, which has meant a lot to the co-op and it's meant a lot to us. But I do need to acknowledge that community engagement takes time and therefore a grant of any less than two years is not sufficient to get anything like the desired outcomes. Of course, the ideal model is recurrent funding for Indigenous advocacy but we'll have to wait and see on that one. Anyway, that's enough from me. I'd just like now to share with you all the voice of Auntie Elva. Uh, it's a short video featuring Auntie Elva Taylor responding to a series of questions about Indigenous advocacy as asked by our Wimmera advocate, Trudy Joyce. Our sincere thanks goes to Auntie Elva and Trudy for creating the video, especially for today. After REACT's presentation, there'll be time for questions and discussion. So thank you very much. So um, thanks, Deb, for um, sharing all your experiences. And I really noticed the, um, the similarities or the um, shared experiences, I think, from both organisations. So I apologise if there's too much repetition because I think we've come to pretty much the same kind of conclusions about working in this area as non-Aboriginal people. So first I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. It is indeed an honour and privilege to present today on this country. Um, this week is of course NAIDOC week and um, it's a very busy time for the community. Um, so like Deb, we invited the people we've been working with to come along today but they are also very busy and engaged in other um, events. So 
We've been working with the Aboriginal communities in the Bendigo, the Chuka and Geelong regions as part of the, you know, the um, Innovation Fund and it's recently been called the Partnership Project. And I really would like to thank our partners in government for this opportunity to work in this area. And I'm also really pleased that it's finished. Um, I'll explain why. This project's really important to, as Deb said, to, to create the opportunity to do new work and to make new connections. But at the same time, the, you know, the limitations of um, uh, timelines, reporting, the whole construct of a project kind of has its end date. So I think working with the Aboriginal community is not a project. It's part of our core business. And as you can imagine, starting a new working relationship takes time. Um, many new ideas or seeds are planted and they really take time to come to fruition. So, and with the projects now ending, there's new initiatives and events which are kind of planned and they will now um, be happening in the near future, so without the project. So I think it's really important to note that. Um, the focus of these projects has been for REAC to walk alongside three Aboriginal community controlled health organisations in co-creating capacity in relation to the NDIS and the ability of the three co-ops to support their communities in this. Now, the people we're working with are the Wadarong in Geelong, the Yoda Yoda people in um, Yonder in the Chuka, and in Bendigo through Bedak with the Zajarung communities. And the way it was funded was a portion of the funds went to each of the co-ops and that allowed them to also employ a part-time worker um, for the duration of the project. Um, personally, this has been you know, a really a, a dream job. Um, the unfinished business of treaty, reconciliation, healing, truth-telling and holistic acknowledgement of this country's first peoples is so critical not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but for all Australians, as this journey is going to define who we are and how we live on this country. I read I, I, lots of information and news, books, articles, and it's a really a useful, necessary activity, but and occasionally something sort of gets past my constructs and goes straight to here. And for someone like myself who's quite cerebral, this, this is when I really pay attention. And so the first reading of the Uluru Statement of the Heart from May 17, um, this profound document of leadership and inspiration, which invites us all to walk with, and it is in this walking and listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that present such profound opportunities for the soul of this country to both heal and grow. And that really made an impact on me because I was already working on this project and the, I think the culmination of the two really was, was personally great timing and it really sort of helped galvanise some of the work I've been involved in. And this idealism or passion for change is, is really good to motivate and inspire but it also has to be checked and put aside because I think for all its good intentions, the history of relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country is full of such well-meaning idealism and change projects. So, in other words, how can you listen if the noise of your own dreaming fills the spaces? So that's, I think, very important to, as Deb mentioned, how do we actually really listen and not be sort of caught in our own constructs about how to do this kind of work. And something we, we, we realised was that this project had to be a shared capacity building project and that the learnings, information exchange and organisational growth was required for all the partners, particularly REAC. And this, I believe, was really important for the outcomes and progress we have made. Because phrases like building capacity kind of, you know, they, they kind of you know, almost, you know, they assume a, like a blank slate, but 
you know, type of terra nullius, dare I say the word. So rather than that, rather than kind of building, I feel like we are exchanging unique capacity knowledge in a mutually beneficial way. It's a two-way exchange. And as Deb said again, one of the first learnings was that the word disability, its meanings, its implications, is not inherent to First Nations peoples. Traditionally, people were perhaps named for their particular disability and they found a place or role within the group. And the impact of 200 plus years of colonisation has damaged some of these cultural bonds. Dispossession from country and kin has been the predominant disabling result of colonisation. So this presents an actual and philosophical challenge for organisations and schemes which are enmeshed in a whole assumed collection of meanings regarding the concept of disability. And so this means that there's people who don't identify as having disability who may benefit from diagnosis and receiving services such as NDIS. And I say may deliberately as there are significant cultural implications for a scheme which is based on the individual and their goals. And so it may be totally appropriate for some participants who identify as Aboriginal, but perhaps not for others. And knowing this matters, having the conversations matters, and this will take time and willingness of predominantly non-Aboriginal organisations to incorporate these understandings into future service delivery. There's a, there's a recent call to have the um, disability included in the close the gap targets. And we think this is an important one, but it should also, by having, if, if that is included, we need to have a, a, a space or a context for different understandings of disability to be included, not just what we may assume disability is. And this is a global issue and it's reflected in one of the conference statements from the Loicha Institute International Indigenous Health and Wellbeing Conference 2019 which met in Darwin last month. And, the, and there's a, a quote from that conference statements at the end of the conference. First Nations people living with, this, with a disability want their voices heard and require space to sit, hear, share, and reflect on issues that affect our wellbeing. We require resources and goodwill to develop structures and networks that will connect with First Nations living with disability community with researchers, services and policy makers within values and cultures that promote their inclusion. And this sort of links to, the, to what um, Debbie mentioned before as well about the work that Scott Avery is doing with um, FPDN and his very important um, research project which is ongoing. So back to our project, I really believe that we've laid the foundations for an enduring partnership. Um, and what does it look like in practice? So, what it means now is that any of the disability teams at the co-ops can pick up the phone or email and request our assistance for a review of a law or an appeal in relation to the NDIS. They can be comfortable in knowing we can give advice, work, brainstorm together and all participant can become a REACT client. Often now we are not needed as the review system is well understood. And now we are working to ensure this knowledge is more widely shared amongst the frontline workers not just located in a small group of individuals. And I think, as again Debbie mentioned earlier, I think the, the personal is so important. I think when, for example, um, one of the workers from the COBS rings REAC, they're not ringing REAC, they're ringing Rachel or Amanda or one of our advocates. Those personal connections and trust is so vital. And it's both a important lesson and also uh, uh, something to be mindful of as, as organisations is how we make sure that we have as many people as possible in that trusting situation. The three co-ops all now have good working relationships with their local area coordinators, have direct access to NDIA planners, managers and the people who are able to resolve issues and work on participant plan tweaking and reviews. Now you expect this to be generally good practice and in a way self-evident. But unfortunately, this was not in place a few years ago. As many of you here today know, the rollout of the scheme has been problematic and fraught with complications, systemic and structural flaws. So, how has this happened? Well, you know, lots of meetings, 
discussions. Personally, lots of trips to Bendigo, Echuca, to chat, to share ideas, to bring people into a room together, to work out how to support the community. Turning up to communities are important. Asking questions. What do they need? What do they want? Listening. Being patient. Trust takes time. Trust takes time. And we've also run training information sessions for cooperative staff, for the doctors, the medical staff around the NDIS, the needs for evidence, how to write the, the various bits of paper they need. Um, we create chem template, template, templates to help guide staff through the processes, flyers, posters, using photos of uh, Indigenous staff and language that engages with community. Um, there's a co-locating co model, which for example now sees the NDIS or LACs working out of the three co-ops on a regular basis. This allows the Aboriginal community members to have these discussions and meetings in a culturally safe space where they are comfortable, more likely to seek supports and assistance. And one of the core barriers to services for Indigenous peoples is often the thought of relating to the government and the actual past negative experiences as previously mentioned. Embedded as it is, so sadly, in the impact of invasion, dispossession and collective cultural trauma. And again, this area is well, well researched by Scott Avery from FPDN, and his work on the concept of apprehended discrimination is really important to, um, I suppose, to understand working in this area. The working relationships between the LACs, NDIA and the cooperatives, and indeed REAC, are overall now very positive and friendly and very effective. REAC and cooperative staff have also worked out of our respective workplaces from time to time with some success in the sense of relationship and knowledge building and I believe we can do more in this area, in this area to, you know, to move into the future. And I'd also like to acknowledge that there has been improvements in how the NDIS approached this working in this area despite their own internal challenges. They're engaging much better with Aboriginal communities, with that ones will work with anyway. And there's a more, um, seems to be a more focused approach that's seen better plan outcomes and minimal need to utilise the formal AAT processes for review. And I really look forward to this continuing and for the NDIA to fully embody their own Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement strategy, which if you're interested in working in this area is well worth a read and, and really holding them to account to that document. And with regards to REAC and our own learning journey, we have made a great start and this will continue on past the expiry of this project. All of our staff have undertaken cultural awareness training and we are in the midst of, uh, of a type of, I suppose, cultural audit in that how we do generally make our offices and brochures, communications, everything we do more appropriate for the actual community. Our staff now attend many more Aboriginal cultural and community events and feel more prepared to work on individual advocacy issues. We are working on our Reconciliation Action Plan and have established a working group within REACT to guide this process. And looking at a whole of organisation approach to working in this area, which I think in the past, um, in my, my opinion, wasn't really there. It was, it was in pockets, I think. Um, and we want to do our small part to be part of the overall systemic and cultural shift which is now, in, now happening. We've had an Aboriginal advocacy manager in the Shepparton region prior to this funding and now have subsequently employed a new Aboriginal worker in that area as well as another person with both work and lived experience within other Aboriginal communities. And now that the project has ceased, each of the three people that were employed through this project through the Aboriginal co-ops have all gone on to other work. They've all become full-time in other capacities, which is really great for them personally, and also helped build that capacity within organisations. The name not themes of voice, treaty, truth are being realised, and we will, I believe, see a voice to parliament, a number of treaties, and some sort of truth-telling on Makarata in the near future. Our leaders will either lead this or be dragged along, but it will happen. With this realisation, I hope that representatives from the NDIA, when enacting NDIS version 2, will sit down with the appropriate people of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community 
and craft a scheme which is both culturally appropriate and aspirational to their own vision. REAC has been fortunate to receive some of the Disability Futures funding to continue our work in the Goulburn area and where the NDIS was launched earlier this year. This project is called Walking With and is inspired by the Uluru Statement. And basically what I think we are really mindful of the things we've learnt from the, the current projects and we were on the sort of use that and learning to move into the, to work in that area with that community. Um, and now, Rachel, if you want to start handing out those flyers, I'd like to really hear some of your, after the video, so you can still hand them out, but then we'll do you. After the video's played, um, I thought it'd be good to hear from the group here about your thoughts on some of these issues. So what Rachel's doing, she's handing out some flyers, which have the Uluru Statement on one side, and a little diagram on the other, which some, with some little prompts. So perhaps with your peers near, near you, you can have a little chat after this video, and then we'll come back with some um, questions and discussion after we've, that's been concluded. So probably about, how long's the video going for? A couple of minutes? And then that's probably another five, so about 10 minutes time. And, oh, one more thing for you, start, is that okay? <laughs> I think it'd be really good um, next, next year or another future um, time to really get, um, I suppose, a gathering of Indigenous and non-Indigenous advocates in a room to, I suppose, share experiences about uh, working with community in a, in a longer format. Because um, I think there's so much to be discussed and shared. And I think it's, we never really need to put the time and effort into doing that. So I would really make that call now. And if anyone's interested, please advocate for that as well. And um, I think even during NADOG week next year, it'll be a really good um, thing to do as well, to really build on this. So thank you all for listening and um, enjoy the video. Um, well, the um, interesting thing I, I got out of it was the disability stuff. What, we, what, we're, what we're allowed to have, what we, we should be having. It's not just the basic stuff. Um, yeah. it, it's really what's out there for us. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. It's there and it will help you. A lot of people don't know that because I noticed myself, I've, I've told people about yourself and the job that you do and it lifts a lot of worry off a lot of us because we sit there and we're going to, how are we going to deal with, how are we going to do this? Because a lot of us uh, in our community are shy and we don't like to speak our mind sometimes, but with this is where the depression comes in then. And they won't leave their house, they're gonna how I'm going to manage this. Um, having an advocate to talk to. Yeah. It's, and you also do the talking on the phone for them, with their permission, of course. Yeah. But that's it's great because a lot of people don't know about you and what you do. Yeah. So if you get it into the co-op here and like I said, put yourself out there. Mm. It's easy The people would start thinking, okay, she's there. It was like me, I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> you come to the co-op and introduce yourself yep. and let everybody know that you know, you're there and what you're there for. Yep. And then when if they need to see you in private, yep. that you're Available. They have, yeah, you're available to do that. Just to yeah. be respectful when they're with the person. And, uh, yeah, um, to um, just let them know yeah. that you're there to help. Well, introduce yourself. These are the what I do if you need any help whatsoever. Because you, you've got to speak on their terms. Yeah. So they can understand. Yeah. As a lot of people won't go and see people because they use their big long words yeah <clears throat> and that's coming from a lot of our people yeah I found it very interesting 
because you showed me things that what I can access and what I need uh, my rights when dealing with these people so yeah it was very very helpful for me it, it's really what's out there for us yeah and that's what it's all about it's there and it will help <clears throat> And it lifts a lot of worry off a lot of us. move to the comments and questions section of this presentation so um, if you have any um, this will be a, um, a free-for-all basically so um, put your hand up and our wonderful microphone people will get to you and um, any comments or questions are, are welcome based on what you've heard and what you've discussed we've got about six minutes <laughs> hi um, Mary Sayers from Children and Young People with Disability Australia. Just wondering in terms of the experience of children and uh, Aboriginal children and young people and what um, you've learnt through your project about their access to the NDIS and um, understanding of um, the NDIS. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, our experience in regards to children and young people has been pretty awful. Uh, in fact, most of the requests for assistance has been about um, helping families have their children um, accepted into the NDIS. Um, a lot of the problems... Okay, so the NDIS has got an Aboriginal... Um, engagement strategy which is good but the strategy seems to lack the implementation plan so um, it's acknowledged that um, special measures need to be put in place uh, but I, I don't see any evidence of that actually um, being translated into action uh, maybe it'll come hopefully um, so a lot of the problem is with access to the scheme and um, a lot of the problem is, especially in our area of remote rural, is getting the required reports. Um, there are families where, uh, you know, a particular one I'm thinking of, where a child is, um, has such a complex disability um, and it's quite clear that the family needs support from the NDIS, but the carer, the mother, can't leave the house because of the level of the disability of the child. So how on earth is she supposed to get a paediatrician's report? How is she supposed to even find a paediatrician in the Wimmera region? Um, and it's just this cycle of uh, nothing can happen because the NDIS is so stringent in what it requires and um, that's a very big headache for everybody concerned. Uh, 
I think it's a, a huge area where improvement needs to happen. Do you think so? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, there is yeah, so much work to be done in this area. And I think um, all what Deb said, but I would add that another confounding factor is the, the past experiences of, of the systems and children. So understandably, there's a lot of fear in communities, I think, from what I've, I've been, uh, people I've, I've spoken with about this, about inviting or talking about their fame situation with the past experience of, of the stolen generation and other such removals of children. So it's a very fraught area for a lot of people and it's gonna take time, systemic advocacy on a massive scale from the whole sector and a real, as, as Deb said, the, the NDIA need to really be thinking about how do we make the scheme work for all Australians, not just what them in their mind what the the um, the target market is for this scheme. It's it's totally a totally different um, scheme within the scheme that is is going to be needed for to really make it work for the actual community. I think I've, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you agree with that, Deb, but I think it's mm. we need to really be. Um, reminding them and, and advocating on that message. I, I think trying to make the community fit the scheme is not going to work. I mean, it can work partially, but for some people, of course, but not for everybody. So, yeah, it's uh, that is a, is a massive area, and I think it's there's no short answer or, or, or shortcuts. This it's just lots of work, and but first of all, a willingness of the the system to really you know, listen and actually do something different, and to pay attention. And, and um, yeah, we actually want to fix some of these systemic barriers. Thanks. Next. I'm conscious of time, sorry. Yeah, hi, I'm Richard Amon from Disability Sport and Recreation. I'm just interested in the, um, the longer term sustainability of this work. I mean, it's fantastic that you've been able to invest time appropriately with these communities and you've only got limited grant funding I understand so yep. what's been your approach about how you approach the future when either the funding dries up or some of these people actually get another job somewhere else and a, a particular champion is now left and that yeah. can leave a gaping hole there's, yeah, there's a few things there I, I, I totally agree and I think um, what we found at REAC is is really improving the capacity of our, of our advocates and our whole organization to incorporate this work into core a core work I think in the past, I think it was a little bit left to specialist in Indigenous advocates. And I think we're trying to move it to become everybody's work. I think that's important. That's a way to, to mitigate some of that um, ending of, of project funding. And um, I think uh, there's no easy way to... It's again, like I said before, how do we, um, as a collective, ask for more resources? Um, and I think over time it will become these projects won't be as needed, but I think at the moment they probably are. What do you think? Deb? Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Um, I guess as far as sustainability goes, that's always a problem with short-term funding. Um, none of us like it. None of us like the hours we have to spend writing submissions and meeting compliance requests. Uh, however, that's the nature of the beast. Um, I guess the short-term funding is a way to show what you can achieve in a small amount of time. Uh, and we need to lobby as a group about better ways to fund this type of work. Um, but I, I think from our point of view, uh, you know, the money, the resources, the funding has given us a chance to really cement our relationships with the co-op. So um, even while the, uh, this particular funding round dries up, the aim has been to have relationships that go on forever. And, um, and that gets back to the trust thing that we've both talked about. So we hope that our um, engagement will continue, obviously, um, to the best of our ability with the limited resources we have. Um, that's the harsh reality of it all. But uh, the, the opportunity to spend, you know, two solid years really um, building relationships that can last is 
is the um, benefit of this type of funding round. Um, Daryl Taylor from Vimeo. Um, I was really struck by your comments about um, dispossession and discrimination being the biggest disability that the communities face. And when you've got a program that's focused on the individual and um, projects the need for self-advocacy, um, you know, what is the NDIS 2.0 that includes that focus on systemic and structural advocacy and on the conditions or of the context and the relationships, uh, the culture, um, and not just that focus on an isolated, separate individual. Mm. I think I get that just, just of, what, of what you're saying. I think um, for me, I don't have the answers because I think the answer is in the conversation. I think that is, that's a really critical thing to, to to really um, get across in that it's, from, I think for all of us working in this area, it's, it's Aboriginal self-determination is critical. So I think it, it's a willingness of government to sit down and actually ask the community what they want. How will, how will we deliver services? How will we help you and your families and your existing kinship and networks of, of relationship to actually work and prosper with the right supports? So I think the atomization or in, the individualized focus of the NDIA, which looks at the person in isolation perhaps, isn't going to work for many people. So I think, and there's something we, we, we've been conscious of, um, I know I was chatting to our advocate in, in Shepparton the other day about this, how, how we engage with a, with a person with disability who is uh, Aboriginal is, first of all, to, to connect with the whole family to look at that person has been embedded in a system of relations and how do we actually work with that and support that first and foremost so that we therefore any intervention or any anything we do is based on that relationship. So I think in summary, I think it really is about, as we we said both our presentations, is the willingness to listen and to and to hear, but then also to actually put that into practice. Because I think the community, to, to my mind, has been talking for a long time about some of these issues, and some of it's getting through, but some of it's not. Mm. Um, I agree, Lance, and I think it's worth remembering too that when the NDIS was devised, First Peoples Disability Network CEO Damien Griffiths, who some of you may have met, if you have met him, you'll know what a great person he is. Um, he was arguing for um, a kind of parallel NDIS for Indigenous communities. And his focus was on the very, very remote areas of Australia, but also, um, you know, it would apply all over the nation. Um, and he was saying that the, the special needs are so immense that there needed to be a different way of going about things for our Indigenous First Nations people. Unfortunately, his representations fell on deaf ears and um, I'm not sure where he's at with that in regards to our MPs now, but um, I think he was on the right track from what we've seen in our, in our um, practical experience. Uh, something definitely needs to change. It is actually not working. And the stats from the NDIS itself shows that um, there's not the take up that uh, was hoped for and expected, I suppose, because you can't just try and make people become, you know, something that'll fit into your, your box yeah thanks for that <laughs> um uh you know there, there needs to be a change and it starts with the listening process and if we can lobby advocate i don't know do whatever we normally do by hassling people i suppose then that's what we should be doing thank you very much Lance and deb it's very clear from both your presentations we've got a long way to go but it's a good way. What I loved about both of your presentations was how we need to learn to 
listen and learn to think outside the way we normally work and change it to fit who we're speaking to. And I think if you both continue the great work you're doing, we can go some way to achieving good outcomes for people. So well done, thank you very much. Um, Deb has some flyers up the front if you would like to collect them on the break. We will break for lunch now. We will come back at one o'clock and hopefully this will all work beautifully and fine for the next presentation. So enjoy, help us out. See you back at one.